All right. We are about midway through our study on, uh, for a lesson, I think we're on lesson five, uh, marijuana, a righteous or moral activity. We covered the first couple of paragraphs here talking about the uh, different, different elements to it. And as, as we have been doing, we're not going to read the whole lesson or anything like that. We are going to cover some of the, some of the highlighted portions though, that uh, have some specific things that we probably need to to look at and consider. Uh, one of the things, of course, we talk about Jeremiah chapter 10, 2 Peter 1, 2 Timothy 3. Uh, certainly those scriptures are uh, applicable in this discussion. Uh, but our writer says, it is the creator, not the creature, that determines right and wrong, just and unjust, moral and immoral, and heaven or hell as a final abode of the spirit of man. Uh, then he mentions the relationship of the righteous and Christ has to be one of respect for the name of Christ, an attitude of not wanting to do anything that would bring shame to the great and glorious name of the Son of God, the King of Kings. Uh, and certainly that is a, uh, a mindset that is important for us to have in, in every aspect of our character. It, part of our example is making sure we don't bring shame on the name of Jesus or on the, on the church. Uh, and certainly if people are aware, and hopefully they are, that we are at least religious or spiritually minded uh, and that we claim to be Christians, certainly they will, many of them will be watching to see if we practice what we preach. Uh, and certainly uh, this is, our conduct can either be a, a boon to help bring people to Christ or it can be a detriment, a stumbling block. Uh, he brings up Colossians 3, verses 2 through 4, set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on the earth. You have died and your life is hidden with Christ and God. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. Setting our mind on the things that are above, that are of the spiritual things. Uh, of course, we mentioned Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8. Whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are holy. Uh, Paul says to meditate on these things. We're not to meditate on uh, unrighteous or sinful things. Thoughts were to meditate on those things that are of God, characteristics of God, certainly God's word as well. But setting our mind on the things above uh, also includes having that, that goal, that this is what I'm striving for. And so that serves kind of as a reminder. That this is part of the reason why we put on the helmet of salvation, so that our thought process is always about getting to heaven. And the goal is that that should help keep us mindful when we do encounter temptation, and we are, when we are considering maybe behaviors that a Christian ought not to be involved in, that that would perhaps help us to avoid those behaviors. Thoughts or comments through that so far? The Christian and Christ are to be inseparable, and the Christian should not set his mind upon anything that Jesus would have no part of. This is further elaborated in Matthew chapter 5, verse 16, where application is made to the effect that people of the world should find in Christians a light to lead them to truth and Jesus. Uh, of course, Matthew 5, the Sermon on the Mount, let your light so shine before men uh, in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Uh, and of course, letting that light so shine goes back to our example, letting Jesus be seen in us. And that goes back to his point about being careful not to be involved in anything that Jesus wouldn't be involved in. Any thought through that? Now, I highlighted in red this last part. Therefore, in order for marijuana smoking to be acceptable in God's eyes, it must do these two things. Help keep Christians faithful and lead people to Christ. It does neither. I would have put that the opposite way. I would have maybe said that in the negative. Uh, that it, in order for it to be acceptable, it can't do these two things calls Christians to not be faithful or to lead people away from Christ. Because you kind of run into that, that, that argument, okay, well, does a Big Mac help keep Christians faithful and lead people to Christ? You know, you have individuals who, who will kind of, the fallacy of that, of that argument of, okay, well, that means everything you do needs to help keep Christians faithful and lead people to Christ. But this is also what they're consuming. Of course, marijuana is consumed to an extent, and that could be applied to anything. And, and so you kind of run into that, that issue. So I would have kind of gone at it from the, from the reverse angle. 
that nothing we do or consume should cause us to not be faithful to the Lord or lead people away from Christ. Uh, and to me, that, that's a little bit sturdier uh, logical argument to, to stand on. Thoughts through that. All right. Uh, he brings up some information. Again, this, the information he's bringing up is in 1978. Obviously, that information has probably changed quite a bit, although I'm sure that the trends have probably stayed the same. The first illegal drug that young people adopt is marijuana. I don't know that that's still true, but there is a hierarchy leading to heroin, which is to say that often what are considered to be less dangerous drugs, less... Uh, maybe less illegal to a certain extent, less illicit drugs, can then lead to more serious issues. Uh, the thing is that when people stop using drugs, they usually go back down these steps in reverse sequence. Anyone who takes the drug and thinks nothing has happened to his body has lost his mind. Uh, this is coming from this uh, U.S. News and World Report that he's quoting here. As we can see, an expert, a member of the President's Drug Abuse Commission, explains that the possible effects of marijuana are nearly all negative in nature. Certainly, we cannot see Jesus engaging in these things, nor can we see Jesus through the person who practices the consumption of marijuana. And, of course, we're focusing on the, the uh, illicit aspect of marijuana. Uh, marijuana. Certainly there are components within marijuana that are being adapted into medicines and things like that. That is a different, uh, different point. Um, anything through that? All right. So at this point in the, uh, the lesson, he starts talking about some of the, the uh, issues that come up with people who are uh, the adverse effects that uh, of people who are involved with, uh, with marijuana. Immunity issues, some studies have shown a marked reduction in white blood cell response, the body's prime defense against infection in marijuana smokers. Uh, there's genetic issues, chromosomes, human cell cultures from pot users have shown breaks in chromosomes carrying genetic information or reduced numbers of chromosomes. Many doctors believe, however, that some people can easily become psychologically dependent on the two drugs, marijuana and cocaine, and the effects that they produce. And of course, we know that that is absolutely true, uh, that there is certainly a physiological dependence. Uh, the body becomes dependent on some of these drugs, certainly to varying degrees, but there's also a psychological element to it as well. Physiological effects found are as follows. There's an increase in heart rate, reddening of the eyes. It's, it's extremely hard on the bronchial system. It's like rubbing sandpaper on lung tissue. And mental and motor performance is impaired, many cases severely. And that certainly has held up, uh, and certainly many of the, the issues that we're seeing in our society right now, especially in places where marijuana has been legalized, uh, individuals who uh, are just kind of lost in uh, an addiction to marijuana or any other type of drug for that matter, certainly you see a, a major impact in their uh, mental abilities as well. Thoughts or comments through that? All right. Uh, we can see, we can clearly see that marijuana is absolutely not productive. Rather, it is absolutely a destructive element to add to an already morally decaying society. Obviously, the Bible does not mention marijuana by name. However, there are God-given principles which we can use to determine the acceptability of the use of this drug. Those principles are in addition to the ones previously mentioned regarding Christ or God's word that have a very direct bearing on the subject at hand. Marijuana is damaging to the body, physically, mentally, and spiritually, and this can be readily established. And, of course, even more broadly than that, willfully damaging our body, especially in such a way that it could have um, long-term and long-lasting problems as well as impacts on others, which is something he's going to get to in just a minute as well, uh, that certainly is something we have to consider, and this is part of what he, he brings up quoting Paul in Corinthians, we consider God's will for our bodies and we discover, what, do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost that is in you, which you have of God and you are not your own? There is no way a Christian, a lover of God, can use marijuana as a pleasure, a reality modifier, and not endanger the attainment of a home in heaven, because he deliberately damages his body. Not to speak, of course, and of course this article doesn't delve into this, or this lesson doesn't, the next one will, uh, which is a lot of people use these types of substances as a means of, of coping, 
whether it's with stress, with uh, worry, whatever the case may be, problems at home, problems at work, uh, and certainly from that aspect of reality modifier, trying to escape something, uh, certainly God gives us coping mechanisms within his word to be able to deal with that. Uh, And certainly the brethren talking to one another uh, is one of those mechanisms, and certainly his word, the prayer, uh, the avenue to be able to, to talk to God that we have, obviously that those are all coping mechanisms as well. Thoughts or comments through that? Yes, sir. Yeah, and that can compound the issue. Uh, that can compound this. Not sometimes it's not just life, which life certainly has its own issues. But uh, sometimes we make these things harder on ourselves than it needs to be, and as a result, we end up trying to escape. Maybe not only because of the stress, but also the guilt, uh, or the the unwillingness to admit that I've done something wrong or something along that line. So certainly that can be a part of it as well. Uh, he quotes Galatians chapter six: "Do not be deceived. God is not mocked." Whatever a man sows, this he will also reap. For the one who sows to his flesh shall from the flesh reap corruption, but the one who sows to the Spirit shall from the Spirit reap eternal life. If man gives in to healthy, unhealthy, sinful, sensual, and fleshly desires unscripturally, then he or she cannot be controlled by God's word. Such a one cannot inherit the kingdom of God according to the word of God. Galatians 5, and of course that deals with the works of the flesh versus the fruits of the Spirit. It is interesting, especially Ephesians 5, 17, do not be filled with wine, but understand what? What the will of the Lord is. Okay, Paul is certainly emphasizing understanding the will of the Lord, and with that understanding, making sure that we're, we're aware of ourselves, because it's in that same context that he describes walking circumspectly, redeeming the time. That means that there needs to be a certain level of sobriety within our mind proper judgment, being able to properly tell the dangers around me, whether those danger, dangers are physical or spiritual, in particular temptation, uh, making sure that I'm aware of myself and aware of my surroundings, able to properly discern right and wrong in any given situation. And unfortunately, certainly there are some medications that can dull that, which is why we have to be very careful when even when we're on prescription medication that may cause those types of issues. But by pursuing things like this, it can cause our, our reality to become muddied. Uh, sometimes we're not aware of what we're doing or aware of ourselves or able to really think through the consequences of our actions. Uh, and as a result, that can greatly increase the likelihood of us doing something, first of all, sinful, but also something that could endanger our, not only our physical life or somebody else's physical life, but also our spiritual life. Thoughts or comments through that? CBD stuff, yeah. But at least you have evidence and proof that this is something. Yes, I, I take this occasionally because I have blah, blah. Right. But you can't do that with some of these synthetic <clears throat> I've actually heard of individuals who went for a, uh, a job interview, had a blood test. They, had, they weren't taking drugs or anything, but they had like a poppy seed muffin for breakfast the day, that day that they had the test. And it came back as, as being illicit. And of course, the test doesn't make any difference between a poppy seed muffin and opioids. Uh, and so they, they didn't get the job and they would try to explain it was a poppy seed, but again, the test doesn't reveal that. So the employer would have to take their word for it. And a lot of employers aren't willing to do that. Uh, in fact, a Mythbusters, Mythbusters even had a, an episode 
kind of evaluating the legitimacy of whether or not a poppy seed muffin would actually show up on a test. Not only did it, but it could continue for up to a week after you have a poppy seed muffin or some kind of poppy seed, anything with poppy seed in it. Uh, in fact, there's a poppy seed salad dressing I like, uh, and it's pretty good. It's pretty sweet. I like it, but it, it can show up on a blood test for up to a week after you've consumed it, which is amazing. And that's not something you really hear about a lot, but that's a great point, Lisa. Yeah, it can affect livelihoods and job applications or current jobs and so forth. Anything else? Yes. Sir. The military has actually been banned any of those substances from their individuals. Really? It's for that reason. So it's to the grace of God with so many people want to camp out on the beach. It's us to live soberly, righteously in God. Yeah. Being in on that word soberly there. This lesson and several others would fall under that same umbrella. Absolutely. Yeah, having a sound mind. So from uh, is a term that was mentioned in the previous lesson, having a sound mind, being able to properly judge. Uh, and uh, again, that's why it, even if we're taking something that is prescribed by a doctor, again, Paul told Timothy to take a little wine for stomach's sake. But did he tell Timothy, and since you need a little wine for your stomach's sake, you might as well go out and drink as much as you want? No, that's not what Paul said. Uh, and we have to be very careful to make sure that even if we're doing something that is legal, uh, that we're not abusing that opportunity or that we're not doing and being involved in things or, or going places or driving to a certain extent, if those substances could cause our, our, uh, our judgment to be impaired. Math? It does, yeah. Years, or go to a different country, or, yeah. So the word of God is a standard, the legal standard fluctuates. That's right. Yeah, that's a great point. Matthew chapter 7 and verse 16, uh, he quotes, Jesus, grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor figs from thistles, are they? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but the rotten tree bears bad fruit. Good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a rotten tree produce good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. What kind of fruit is the consumption of marijuana? And even beyond the consumption of it, the, what it produces, what are the results of it, certainly cannot assist us in, first of all, serving God, much less being an example to others, certainly to that extent. Can the child of God, the Christian, do anything except totally abstain and please his creator? But examine everything carefully, hold fast to that which is good, abstain from every form of evil. Uh, which, of course, that's the basis of uh, the title of our book, which is abstaining from every form of evil. Thoughts or comments through the end of the lesson here? Yes, sir. Right. You know, you, you talk about maturity and the ability to overcome hardship. We, anytime, this life is full of hardship. We know that. Okay. It's full of sorrow. It's full of difficult times, whether those difficulties come from work, from home, from friends, from loved ones, whatever it may be. We can't run to come some kind of a substance to escape, which is it an escape really? still going to be there, which is ultimately what leads a lot of people to continually go back over and over and over again, because they, it's not an escape. They're just kind of burying their head in the sand. It's not doing anything. Uh, it's not resolving whatever the situation is, if you have any control over it or any responsibility in whatever the problem may be. And even which 90% of the time, 99% of the time, it, there's nothing we can do about the stuff we worry the most about. And yet, we still have to be able to deal with that type of worry or that concern that we may have over a given situation. And as a result, I mean, certainly there are things we can do to help kind of take our minds off of it. Okay. Some people exercise. I know one person 
uh, when they get stressed out, they just run. They go jog. They run and run and run. And sometimes they'll run several miles before coming home if it's something that they're really stressed about. And I think, I mean, that's a great, that's a great thing to do. It's a great way to, to deal with it. But while they run, they're also praying. And, and to me, it's not just the running, I think, that helps them. It's the praying, certainly, I believe, probably even has more of a benefit, uh, talking to God about it. But, but we, if we're trying to escape or trying to rid ourselves of the burden, uh, temporarily though it may be, then we're not gaining those skills and we're not practicing and honing our ability to overcome whatever it is that we're dealing with. And if we are to be full-grown, mature Christians who have need of meat and not milk, okay, as the Hebrew writer says in chapter 5, full-grown Christians, they have their senses exercised to discern right and wrong. And I think you can include in that concept of, of mature Christian as someone who has honed themselves not only to discern right and wrong, but to be able to apply right and wrong in any situation, whether that situation is everything's fine or I'm having difficulty in my life. Whereas a lot of people, especially in our, our society today, and it's nothing new. I mean, man has always come up with some substance or some means to be able to escape from time to time. Uh, but that doesn't mean that the people of God need to be involved in that. And certainly that, that goes back, as Dale mentioned, goes back to maturity and making sure that we are growing, yes, as human beings, as individuals, mentally and emotionally, but especially spiritually. Any other thoughts through that? That's a great point. That's a great point. And, and certainly, I think, you know, for many of us, I'm sure, are familiar with any of these lessons. Okay, I think most of us will probably have heard at some point most of the stuff that's being brought up in these lessons. But to stress it, not only as a reminder for us, I mean, one of the things that Peter brought up over and over again in Second Peter is, I write these things to remind you. And he mentioned that on several occasions. I'm going to make sure you have reminders of this all the time. But also to stress to us that our society is such that there's a lot of pressure on, on young people, whether it's peer pressure or, or uh, aspects of, of not knowing how to handle the world, handle uh, whether it's political or societal type of issues. Uh, people may be making fun of them because of what they believe or they don't believe the way they do. A lot of times our kids may not have the and certainly as children, they don't. They haven't been equipped. They haven't grown enough to know how to deal with that type of pressure. And it, unfortunately, especially with sexuality the way it is going on right now, kids are being pressured far too young to deal with those types of, of issues. They're not equipped for it. And so parents, grandparents, we're having to talk to our children younger and younger and younger to make sure that they're aware of what things that they may hear, what God's word says about things that they may hear, what to do if they hear that, what should they say if somebody asks them something about it, to be able to help them to learn how to deal with those things. We live in a society where we have kids who are 11 and 12 years old committing suicide because of pressure from their peers, from their friends from teachers and whatnot, that's just, it's, that goes back to not being able to, to cope with what they're facing. And it, it just goes to show that as parents, we have to, and grandparents or aunts and uncles, whatever we may be, we have to be able to help our, our kids to unfortunately kind of grow up a little bit quicker maybe than we did when we were their age. Any other thoughts of that? Ellen? Yeah. When we, if we're in a situation where we're thinking about it, yeah. types of things. And, that, and that's a great point as well. The fact that our society, and it always has been, uh, I was just having a conversation with my grandmother uh, a couple of days ago. She was saying it, 
it's just so much worse than it was when, you know, I was young. And I said, well, I know it, I'm sure it does seem that way. And it certainly has that perspective. But man has always been like this. Society has always been like this. Man has always been selfish. In fact, there was a point, at least in percentages, that it was even worse than it is now. When was that? Yeah, before the flood. I mean, there were only eight people out of, we don't know how many, millions of people, at least, that were what God considered to be righteous. I don't know what the percentage of that would be, but it's not good. And so man has always been selfish. He's always thought about himself first. And that's one of the, the calls of the gospel is to think about God first, first of all. And also the second is like until we love God, but what's the second greatest of the law? To love our neighbor as ourselves. Okay? To consider ourselves servants to God and servants to others. Uh, and in our society, people don't want to consider themselves servants. That's a terrible, terrible thing to even suggest that they are. And yet, that's what God calls on us to be. Anything else through that? All right. Let's cover our questions real quickly. Um, so I, I wrote some of these in. I'm going to try to cover them up. 16,000 Americans are current users. Who said it? Dr. DuPont. Oh, is that a typo? It might be 60 million. Yeah, 16 million. Yeah, the, yeah, the quote is in that first, second paragraph of the, of the lesson. Yeah, Dr. DuPont. Uh, it is not a man who walks to direct his steps. Jeremiah. I mean, obviously, any scripture is going to be God, but I think we're talking about the person who wrote it. Uh, Jeremiah. Set your mind on the things above, not on things that are on the earth. Paul. In Philippians, the first illegal drug that young people adopt is marijuana. Uh, then there is a hierarchy leading to heroin. Dr. DuPont, some of the effects of marijuana on the body are increase in heart rate, reddening of the eyes, extremely hard on bronchial system. That one's actually Dr. Rosengard. That's in that, on the third page of that lesson. Uh, a nut from another... Uh, one of those studies that he quotes. Uh, the body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. Paul mentioned that. A uh, good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor a rotten tree produce good fruit. Jesus said that. All right, fill in the blank, blanks. It, and like I said, I, I filled these in, but obviously it won't be any good to ask. It is the creator, not the creator, or not the creator, not the creature that determines right and wrong. Let your light so shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. Of course, I have the, the King James and the New King James Version in my head. I think he's using the ASV, the American Standard. Um, number three, some studies have shown a marked reduction in white blood cell response to marijuana smokers. Number four, human cell cultures from pot users have shown breaks in chromosomes carrying genetic information. Number five, smoking marijuana is like rubbing sandpaper on lung tissue. Number six, one marijuana joint is equivalent in terms of respiratory system damage to 21 tobacco cigarettes. Number seven, marijuana is damaging to the body physically, mentally, and spiritually. Number eight, one who gives in to unhealthy, sinful, and fleshly desires cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Okay. Uh, true or false? Number one, 10% of all automobile accidents are attributed to marijuana in 1978. Obviously, you can see 15 there. What's quoted was 15%. I don't know that that's still true or if it's even close to 15%. But at the very least, I'm sure illicit drugs, certainly alcohol, uh, but drugs or even if whether they're illicit or legal, uh, I'm sure there's quite a bit attributed to automobile accidents. Number two, God, not human actions and rationalizations determine righteousness and morality. That's true. Number three, a Christian should not want to do anything that would shame the name of Jesus. Yeah, true. Number four, one can take marijuana and not do serious harm to his body. I, I, I would include certainly the potential. I mean, I'm sure there are occasions where some people may be able to smoke one joint or whatever, and it may not do any long lasting, but the potential certainly is there. 
uh, and certainly with repeated use, there is serious harm to the body. Number five, there would be no basic danger to society if marijuana were legalized. That's false, especially given the automobile accidents and the change of the, the mind that takes place. Number six, we can experiment with marijuana and not be endangered by it. False. Number seven, marijuana is wrong because of the evil fruits it produces. Yeah, yeah true. Uh, certainly, I mean, there's a whole lot more to that as well, but certainly what comes from marijuana in terms of the purpose for, be, for using it and then behaviors and so forth that can come from it certainly is evil. Number eight, the Christian should totally abstain from marijuana in context of our lesson. True. Yeah, of course, there are certainly studies being done about the possible benefits of certain components of marijuana in medicinal purposes, cancer treatments, things like that. That's different, totally different uh, discussion. Opioids would be no different uh, or any other. Really, most of our medicine comes from plants and stuff like that. I mean, it's not any different in terms of pharmacology when used in that way. All right. Any questions through those, qu those questions? Yes, sir. As a comment on number seven, the evil fruit that it produces, sometimes the evil fruit may not have been intended. Sure. We see that time after time in the Bible, people will get drunk and end up doing things that they would have had no intention of doing had they been sober. Absolutely. That's what sobriety keeps coming back to my mind. Absolutely. And that's a great point. Uh, in fact, in the next lesson, uh, there's a situation that comes up with um, Tamar. Uh, Tamar and what was the name of the Tamar and I can't remember his name. Anyway, it's in the next lesson uh, where uh, Tamar's raped and part of that account deals with, uh, has to deal with sobriety or lack of thereof. Uh, somebody was drinking too much and decided to do something and that was part of it. All right. Anything else through lesson five? Yes, sir. Just one more point. Um, something that our, especially our youth, have been doing a lot is vaping. Yeah. And it's supposed to start out innocent as a replacement for smoking, but then it goes to heavy nicotine, and now they have marijuana vaping. Yeah. They get away with it even in dorms these days because there's not a lot of smell to it. Yeah. And it's a big, big problem. Well, and what's... You know, initially when vaping became a thing, of course, there were different flavors and things like that. I think a lot of those have been outlawed now or banned. Uh, but there, you know, certainly there, weren't, there wasn't a lot of information on the effects of the body that vaping had when it first started. And the same was true with just about everything, cigarettes and things like that. But more and more information is coming, about, coming out about vaping and how much damage it can do, that it's, it's really not any better than smoking a cigarette or anything else. Uh, it seems more innocent, it seems less damaging, and yet it's not. Uh, and again, to me, it goes back to the purpose for which one is, is doing it to start with. Uh, in a lot of ways, some of these things start out maybe as a fad. You know, uh, cigarettes, it was kind of the thing to do back in the 40s and the 50s and into the 60s. This is what you did. In fact, I, I remember stories from people who... Uh, were members of the church in the 60s and, you know, pe pe members of the church would smoke. And there wasn't any information to suggest it was wrong or anything or bad it, for you. It was just a thing you did. And yet, of course, we know that it's not. But part of the uh, appeal, I think, of things like vaping is that, I know it sounds cliche and almost roll, i.e. cringeworthy to say, it makes you look cool, but in a lot of ways, it kind of, I think, it appeals to people because it kind of helps you to fit in. Even with people who may be smoking, well, you're vaping. I mean, that's kind of the same. And so you're just kind of like one of the guys or you know, one of your friends. It's the same, same difference. And certainly to me, if you're doing something just even to fit in, something that is sinful or even could lead to something sinful, then I have to examine what my motivations are. Why am I doing this to start with? I'm doing it to please men. I'm not doing it to please God. And I'm not doing it to serve others. I'm doing it to please them or to appease them. And that certainly should never be a reason for why we do anything. Anything else through that? Some people say it's less offensive to others. 
Yeah. Less offensive, yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. That, that's just a, that's another rationalization, though. Okay, but you're still doing harm to yourself. <laughs> so, yeah. Anyway. All right. Anything else? All right. Going into lesson six, the problem of drink. In Galatians chapter five, verse twenty-one. Paul lists drunkenness as one of the works of the flesh. Here it is clearly indicated that the impenitent drunkard shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Same apostle, Paul also declares that a local congregation is not to extend to or maintain its fellowship with the drunkard. Uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, Now I have written unto you not to keep company, if any man is called a railer, a drunkard, or an extortioner, with such a one not to eat. Therefore, if in facing the problem of the drinking of alcoholic beverages, the extent of it were drunkenness, then the solution would be plainly set before us. There is more to the matter, however, than just drunkenness. Obviously, drunkenness is one thing, and that's what the, he starts off with from the very get-go. Christians agree that drunkenness is sinful. Not very many, none that I know of anyway, no Christians or even necessarily people who claim to be Christians, not, again, none that I've encountered, have ever said that getting drunk was okay. However, there are people who argue, even within the church, that as long as you don't get drunk, then it's not a problem. Uh, within our lesson, there's a lot of statistics that's brought up here, uh, and so I didn't highlight a whole bunch of that. Again, that's why we have our books, to read these things uh, at home. Uh, but he brings up under this, this category of uh, drinking is a very real problem. Those involved in between one-fourth and three-fourths of the divorces obtained in this country uh, have listed drinking as either the primary cause or contributing factor. I thought that was interesting. I mean, in addition to the other statistics about accidents and things like that, uh, I hadn't even thought about impact it has on relationships, marriages with spouse, and so forth. Uh, I hadn't even thought about that until he brought that up. I don't know what it would be now. Again, I don't know when this was specifically written, but or when that information was uh, was written. When we view television, we receive the distorted impression that drinking is always pleasant, beneficial, and good. And when I read that paragraph, there's one particular sitcom that came to my mind. It was very popular in the 90s. Does anybody remember? Cheers. And there's a related one. Well, Fra I was thinking of Frasier. Frasier. Yeah, Friends certainly would be one as well. Uh, but especially in Frasier, of course, Frasier had his start on Cheers. But Frasier was always seen as this kind of sophisticated fella. He always liked to drink sherry. He always had it in a decanter. And in every episode, at some point, he and his brother start talking about different wines and, and different, you know, alcohols and things like that. And it was kind of viewed as this, it's a sophisticated type of thing, especially having knowledge of it. And uh, in fact, at one point, I think uh, Frazier and Niles were both vying for head of the wine club or something. And they had to be able to be blindfolded and be able to tell exactly which wine they were drinking. It's kind of portrayed as that type of a uh, uh, fun good social type of element to it. And when he mentioned that in this paragraph, that was the first thing that came to mind is how it's portrayed in, in shows like Cheers and, and Frasier and, and certainly a lot of other uh, sitcoms as well. Thoughts through that. All right. He goes on to talk about uh, this nature of the problem. He says there's two facts that stand out. One, of those who drink, Four out of five men and two out of three women began to do so before they entered college. This indicates that drinking originates in high school age groups, or at least the vast majority of it would seem to be, at least according to that statistic. Number two, the incidence of drinking among these students increased with each year that they spent in college. Thus, the habit of drinking is one that begins with young people. Now, I can think of, I can think of a couple, but what do you think would be an explanation for why that might be for number two. Why drinking among students increased with each year that a, that a student was in college. Yeah, I mean, you, you think about, first of all, okay, I, I could see maybe for some of them, stress of you know, keeping their academics up or whatever it may be, stress of whatever activities they're involved in. I could see that maybe being part of it. But 
generally college life, especially in our society today, is viewed as what? Party time. Yeah. Sororities, fraternities. I mean, of course, there's a whole issue in our society with hazing and things like that. But you've got this is kind of what college kids are supposed to be doing. They're supposed to be out partying and drinking and things like that. That's kind of how it's portrayed. And it certainly would seem as though, whether you want to call it peer pressure or desire to fit in, whatever you want to call it, that that might be maybe a large part of why that statistic, that point number two, is what it is. Because this is kind of expected of you to just, you know, hang out with your friends and go drinking and do whatever, do whatever. Thoughts through that. Uh, which certainly brings up another point, you know, that Joe mentioned earlier about making sure our kids understand, especially our kids who are in high school and maybe getting ready to graduate or, or have graduated, going to college, whatever, that they are aware that this is what you're going to face. This is what your friends, this is what, I mean, you get together for a study group, okay? A lot of times you have people go on a study group, they stay at Starbucks or they stay at Frank and Joe's or something, and they sit and they study. But sometimes it's not. So, and maybe sometimes after they study, okay, hey, well, let's go hit the bar. You know, hey, we'll all go together and we'll, we'll continue to study a little bit when we're at the bar. The temptation is there to go right along with it. You know, certainly we have to be able to be careful of that. Uh, the next statement uh, that I, I highlight says, alcohol is a narcotic that removes inhibitions. In my mind, I think of a narcotic as an opioid. However, the term narcotic, narc means to sleep or sleeping, and the otic part means to be in the state of or to become in the state of. And certainly does alcohol lend itself to one sleeping? Yeah. Yeah. And so uh, it's interesting that because uh, I actually Googled that. I'm like, is alcohol a narcotic? Because I had never heard it was a narcotic. Apparently, there's two ways to use the term narcotic. One is the specific pharmacology way, which is having to do with opioids and you know drugs. But the other is a more broad statement or phrase to represent something that can bring about a state of stupor, okay? A state of not being aware of oneself, uh, a state of falling asleep. And, and that's how I believe our writers using this, not that it's literally a narcotic, but that it puts one into that state. All right, we will stop there. We will pick up here and finish lesson six, Lord willing, next Sunday. Thank you, everybody.